On Sunday afternoons during the summer, musicians and dancers gather at Mabry Mill along the Blue Ridge Parkway in Southern Virginia. I don't know how, really, how come us to get started here. Was, uh, some of them just got to playing music, and we, and we just sort of gathered in by accident, and just and then got to coming over here every weekend. And then for the last eight or ten years, we've been coming here every Sunday evening. <laughs> Luther Boyd's fluid style is built on his own favorite step. He spices it up from time to time with smooth changes to other moves. Things that I do, yeah. just plumb old country flat foot. Yeah. Dancers have long gathered at Cataloochee Ranch near Maggie Valley. We asked a group of dancers from around North Carolina to share their thoughts on dancing. To me, the buck and wing dance is a, well, it's a great deal like a uh, banjo player. If he walks into a room and a banjo is sitting there, he wants to pick it up and get the music out. If I walk into the room while he's playing that banjo, the music within me is in my feet. So therefore, I bring it out that way. He's a getting it out of a banjo. I'm a getting it out of my feet. Uh, I feel like this is a, these dances are freedom dances. Uh, freedom by meaning uh, is people tend to do this when they're through work. You know, they're free from their day's work. Uh, it's a time to relax and celebrate. And uh, also freedom by meaning uh, you're never wrong. You know, you can be taught or you can watch and you can do this. And everybody's different, but yet everybody's right. I think it's the same goal. I mean, you know, if you, a lot of places, and you're going downtown, a lot of people take this street, a lot of people take that street, a lot of people take other routes, everything. But your destination is the same. It's the 
or expression or personality. When you dance, you do everything you do. It's, it's an expression of your being. Well, the step dancing, the making of rhythms with the feet that we're talking about, both the, the buck dancing done by the black community in the rural south and also the clogging, flat-footing buck dancing that comes from the Southern Appalachia Mountains is really a, seem to be a product of many different types of traditional dancing from different parts of the world that have met here. And this is the only place in the world where these dances have all come together. And these are two ways of making rhythms that um, have come out of it. And I think the most important thing is, is that so far it's a dance that's never been standardized. It's a dance where people can get up and express themselves individually. Nobody can tell you you're doing it right or wrong. You can change your style of dancing to try to fit a particular um, competition or set of rules where people are judging if you want to. But I think most people get their enjoyment from just getting up and reacting to music, letting the rhythms come out of their feet. And you don't have to be on a dance floor to express yourself. Uh, I've done it on the street. To hear music, may dance a step or two, or in a grocery store. Uh, it doesn't make any difference where you are. You're answering the music, or I am, with by the English, in other words. My feet, hands, and all. Jay Burris lives near Galax, Virginia. His style is clean and percussive. He's won many flatfoot contests, especially at the Galax Fiddlers Convention. Jay calls the fast, continuous rhythm that he often uses to start a dance, cutting the pigeon wing. You can hear it extra clearly on the concrete floor of his porch. I guess every time I heard music, I was on the floor. <laughs> My mother said she believed I came here dancing. <laughs> and in those uh, younger years when my dad played the fiddle, every time he'd play, I'd try to dance. I reckon that was one way I learned. Mm -hmm. And some of the first steps that I do when I first go into a dance is steps that I, that I started with when I first learned to dance. And then over the years, that uh, as other dances come along, I started changing, getting more steps, different kind of steps. And when rock and roll came in, started jitterbugging, some of those steps crept in, uh, creeped into my dancing. Got some of those steps in there. But uh, the main basic steps that I started to go with, I'll demonstrate a little of it if I can, is just Mm -hmm. 
all uh, flatfoot dancers that I can ever remember, they put more dependence in keeping time to the music. Mm -hmm. If a note's in the music, put the note in there with your feet when you're dancing it. Mm -hmm. And that is the basics, I believe, to flatfoot dancing or any kind of dancer. If you don't keep in time with the music, you're just not dancing. <laughs> The really old time flat foot dancing. To really see how it's done, you got to get somebody older than I am to tell you how it's done. <laughs> because I forgot a lot of the early steps that I used to do. And once you go from one to another, it's hard to ever come back to those steps again. In southeastern Kentucky, some people call their dancing hoedowning. Hoedowning can be a stylized walking step done solo or sometimes during a square or circle dance. Willis Fields uses a lot of arm and shoulder movement in his vigorous style, and his foot movement is more varied than most. Well, I was about uh, between seven and eight years old. Grand Ice, no man Grand Ice from the head of Kingdom Come, that's where I was raised at on Kingdom Come. His daughter, Avis, took me through the first square dance. I enjoyed it so much, you know, that's something, you know, when you enjoy something, you don't forget it when you do it. And I, I remember that first square dance up at Herman Ice and had a bean string. In other words, they had a big room, you know, like this, and it power full of green beans. Everybody come. When you get them beans strung, broke up, you square dance. You didn't square dance, you get them beans broke up. Mm -hmm. And uh, you start square dancing, you square dance stuff. So you get ready to quit daylight if you want to. I remember one time we went there and he had a boy named Albert. And uh, Herman told us, he said, I don't want nary pluck on the five string until these beans are strong. Mm -hmm. Boy, he bound to have 20 bushes in the middle of the floor and everybody sitting around the walls, you know, stringing beans. And everybody wanting to square dance so bad they could taste it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyway, Albert, Albert told me, he said, we're in there, we'll get these beans strong time for dance. He said, the old man, when he goes in the kitchen, his old log house, he said, you get up and go outside. I'll fill this bushel basket full of beans, hand them out the window to you. He said, you pull them in the creek, we'll get rid of these beans. He said, we got to. So I went on the outside. And everybody see what was coming off, so they'd say, we need a drink of water. The old man Herman, he'd go in the opposite room in the kitchen to get the water. While he's gone, they fill that basket up full of beans, stick them out the window, and I'm them in the creek, you know. <laughs> it wasn't long, we had the beans all strung. <laughs> Why wasn't in the creek, you know? <laughs> we got the dancing. Oh, next day, though, when he found his beans in that creek, <sighs> man, he, he whooped off it, brother, and he was a grown man. <laughs> Willis Fields is calling, give old Tucker a chance. There's always one extra dancer without a partner who gets a chance to do a hoedown solo. Alja Mae Hinton is from the area just east of Raleigh, North Carolina. She gets a variety of sounds in her buck dancing by using her heel and toe distinctly for touching, slapping, or sliding, which all contribute to her syncopated style.
I first start dancing, you know, I just do the old twists and things, you know, like that. And um, then after a while, I pick up that old time book dance, you know. See, I've been dancing since I was a little bit of girl. I was, I, mom told me one day, they start slapping like that, when they slap like that, I said, oh, sure, I can do that. And uh, I said, So Al Jamae, this is my Al Jamae. Oh, that ain't there. Now I went to Chevron on cold like this year. That my daddy. We be blowing a bottle, you know, my cousin. And I be picking guitar. Someone be playing the spoon. Someone be playing the washboard. Mm -hmm. So we, we just knock up some once in a while. Mm -hmm. I can't be still myself. Some seems to think that uh, flat foot and clogging is the same thing, but it's not. You look it up in any kind of a book or anything that you can go by, it's dancing and see how much difference there are in it. Well, there's two different steps there. What is the difference between flat foot and buck and clog? Mm. Buck dance is a dance you get up higher, and it's not much of your feet is it going to be on that floor patting like flat foot. And clogging, you swing your feet around a lot. Behind you, you've seen them twist their feet and everything, legs and stuff, you know. Well, now that, it, to me, now that's clogging. And to me, that's counted clogging. And this your regular old flat foot down on the floor. There's three different dances there to believe that night. See it. three different names of them dances. On Saturday nights, Gussie Lane is usually out on this floor with about 50 other dancers from the community who gather at Joe and Jeanette Carter's music barn in southwestern Virginia. Gussie can be a subtle flat footer, but he also likes to be a real character on the floor, doing much of what he does for humor and effect. Here he is dancing a variety of broad moves that appeal to both audience and camera.
they'd come to our house, people would, and we lived a long ways, you know, out in the, up on the hills and nowhere to go. There was nothing but dirt roads and no way to go anywhere but ride the horse, horseback. And uh, they'd just come there and they'd just, my dad played the fiddle and uh, there's other old time men come in and played the fiddle. They'd come for miles and stay all night with us, maybe a week sometimes. And they'd play and we'd, and they'd uh, come there and some of them could dance and we'd just see them dancing and just learn to dance after them. Just learn their steps as they dance. What did they call that? Uh, type of dancing that you did? Well, it's called something like flat foot dancing, and uh, some of them called it two step, some of them called it side step, some of them called it the back step. And this is already like that. They never done uh, no Charleston dance or anything like that. We never did see them a dance of that, you know, until we got growing up. And, you know, years ago, we'd never seen nothing like a Charleston dance. All right, I'll start playing. <laughs> As with most flatfoot dancers, Phoebe Parsons' style is understated. We can imagine that even in her younger years, her steps would have been subtle and close to the ground, though more nimble and perhaps a little quicker. Here she dances six or seven movements using scuffs, shuffles, stamps, and hops while most of the time keeping a beat with a barely perceptible tapping of her left toe. The Maggie Valley area has long had an active dance community. Recently, the focus for the dancers of the entire region has become Kyle Edwards' stomping ground. Team clogging was created here in western North Carolina, and caller Jim Hyatt once danced with the legendary Soko Gap dancers, one of the first organized groups. the first dance I ever got in or went to and I was looking for an uncle of mine and that's where I found him was at a square dance and of course he says we'll fall right in and go through this and I've been dancing ever since so now where I learn it I guess it's just there <laughs> John Reeves first learned his dancing from his uncle, Sam Queen, who organized the Soko Gap team in the 1920s. John Buck dances entirely up on his toes, even when he bends his knees way down to do the broken wing step.
attention to me is they don't name their steps. They don't wear taps. They're, it's a, they're, they're more freedom-oriented. They, uh, they do what they feel, but they do, uh, they do dance exactly with the music. When the music changes, they either move around or they float around. And they, I would say a buck dancer would be on the toes most times. A buck dancer uh, keeps his hands, he dances from like his waist down, and his feet does a, a, a lot of things. And you get a lot of different sounds, a lot of trickery, a lot of show, a whole lot of show on the butt dancer. But a butt dancer, uh, they, I feel like they feel what they're doing more in, in the club. To be a to be a butt dancer, I feel like you have to feel it. somebody to be a, a good butt dancer, you just about have to be raised around it. You have to, you have to memorize it. You have to see it so much as it's just there. I'd say my mother was probably the most influential. When I was young, she had a, a country store with a nickel jukebox. And I would beg nickels to get to dance for people. And I'd say, mister, if you got a nickel, I'll show you something. I got, I got started in the clogging pub when I was about five years old, buck dancing. And uh, I used to go to my grandmother's little country store, too, and I'd dance in the jukebox. And on Saturday nights, we'd all go to a place up the road and dance. And um, uh, I used to be on a team, and I danced on that team for about three years. It was the Maggie Mountain Dancers. And when I got in high school, I sort of... I sort of backed away from it for a couple of years, and then I, I got started into it real big, and I started practicing. I started, I started learning what I was doing. I never knew what I was doing before. And I'd get in front of a mirror and try to figure out every step and different ways to do it, and I tried to figure out what I was doing so I could teach other people. This is the way a buck dancer should sound. My opinion, flat foot dancing. Flat footers have a lot. A lot of that in. They have a lot of drag slides, which is this. And uh, if you if you mix a clogger and a flat foot dancer together and a buck dancer, I think this is what you get. Because uh, some of my favorite older dancers dance like this.
constant rhythm. New steps are great if they're based on the old style. In other words, if you don't get out on left field or something. I try to keep it, I try to keep a circle, I try to keep it around the older dancers, the older style. And I think when you watch the film of the, of the guys that's dancing, the older guys, you can see the similarity, especially the sound. You're going to hear all the same sound. Uh, uh, mine may be more distinct. You, some of it may sound clear. That's because I've tried to, to, I've worked on it a lot. But the new steps, the new steps, they look different, and they're not crazy, and uh, they make the dancers, especially the young dancers, it, it keeps them interested. <laughs> Dancing and clogging live side by side in Maggie, each rubbing off on the other. Burton Edwards learned his first steps from his dad and other people in the community. He's refined them and picked up steps from clogging and other dance styles, and he's created new steps. Now Kyle watches his son as much as Burton watches his dad, and they trade steps back and forth. At the Catalucci meeting, dancers told stories of parties and frolics around home and at community gatherings, often after a hard day's work. Well, there used to be five, four or five boys that worked on old 60 highway. They'd come over on Friday night, sometime all the way through the week, and we'd play and dance. You used to have old uh, corn shuckings. <laughs> Wood chopping events, and when they get through, that's yeah, but in the neighborhood, that's more or less well, it doesn't eat a plenty. Time you taste everything, you'd be full. And they'd have two or three jars of whiskey at the bottom of the corn pile. Yeah, but it's really pretty good. That's where you got a lot of that head. Well, we had a lot of plays at the house. And also for the schools in the fall of the year, near Christmas parties. And then we go to somebody's house and date the rest of the night. We used to go around to the white houses after the sale of tobacco, and people would congregate. And you see some of the dancers come out there with chocolate, bug dancers, and things like that. And 
Well, this crowd gave them money, and I was looking, and I always got answers. And the way money was, I said, I would love to get a little bit of it, too. If a person got up there and did some kind of funny step, then you would practice that for quite a few days. Get it in your mind. And then maybe the next time you go, you would present that, and you'd find another little step somebody done did. it. But in, in one sense, you you got to be competitive if you're going to try to dance. My dad entered a competition, and I think it was, he was 16, 1936, and the uh, um, Grand Ole Opry traveling show, the Martha White Flower show that was on the road, would come around to towns and put up tents, and in and, and Seven Springs, North Carolina, they went to did one of their tent shows, and they'd come into town on Friday night, they would have a local fiddle competition or talent competition to let everybody know they were in town, and then on Saturday night, the performers that were on the road show would do their performance. And on this Friday night, <coughs> my daddy grew up with this um, uh, black guy that was in his neighborhood that was the same age he was, and um, my dad was playing a banjo by that time and harmonica at the same time. And so they entered the competition that night, and my dad entered playing the banjo and the harmonica, and Rudolph Garner wanted to dance, but nobody would play for him. So my dad told him he'd play for him, and he entered, did buck dance, and my dad played the banjo for him, and some fiddler won first place, and my dad won second place, and Rudolph won third place. In that family of mine, if they got together, someone won the dance. So, someone got the music, and that's all they done. There wasn't any. In fact, more than likely, they didn't have the room for a square dance. So, it'd be each individual doing his thing, in other words. People out in the country, they used to have wood cuttings and cone shuckings, and uh, after that, and after all the evening, they'd have a big frolic, somebody playing guitars, and uh, the old sausage was the main thing out, and uh, I guess everybody else was, I was, you get to yourself, you practice this and practice this, the next entertainment place to have, you'd try it out, and you'd find out what the neighbors had, but uh, I think most dancers, they have a little imaginary beat in the head, but you had old guitar music and hand slapping, you know. They used to, a lot of times, didn't have any, no instruments, no music, and so they would start out hand slapping this. Many variations of it, you can just, then you can, You could add another lick to it. <laughs> well, I had an uncle, he could do buck dance, but I just caught just a little from looking at him. He just didn't sit down and teach me. So he uh, does his buck, he didn't do tapping. So I had a cousin could tap. So I more or less looked at him and got my little tapping from my cousin. But neither one didn't take up too much time. I just, whenever I see them do it, I just had to pick it up that way. 
All you don't do it. It didn't take time. So well, you got the wrong step. You were so I practically learned myself. So I see him. I can't uh, do it as well as he do the book, but he did something sort of this on the heel and uh, toe like that. So on the heel and your toe, that is called the book. So when you raise it up on your toes. As you change it from a book to a tap, so it goes. <laughs> book go heels and toe. You mostly flat footing. That's the book, okay? You change it over to a tap, which is on your toes, it goes just as... I guess everybody got a different way of doing it, but... A little, well, a little, you start the book, I reckon you'd call it the book dance, you'd say that you just. I guess that's the way we started out, community gatherings on a weekend celebration or something. This is an old edition of the train, of old steam train. They are these of the day, but when those steam was out, it goes something as like this. Staged tap dancing was refined from older traditional dances. Then it fed back into the traditions that it came from. As people moved from the country to towns, there was more and more trading of dance styles and steps. Often a dancer's most prized possession was the ability to express individuality and creativity.
first time I remember book dancing, my mother could do book dance. I was about 13 or 14 years old, and my uncle played a banjo. And uh, I would dance, and then I'd, they'd have um, square dances, first one place and then another. They'd won't always bring me and won't want to see me dance. With all the steps, I just guessed at them, and so my, that I uh, learned from other folks. Biddy Reese was raised near Deep Gap in northwestern North Carolina. She started dancing as a child about 1915. Each of her steps is clear and distinct from the next, and she has about six or eight that she does here. In the same way that the fiddle is considered by some to be the devil's instrument, the dancing that goes with it is judged no more lightly. Well, I'll tell you, <coughs> I have danced ever since I was about 12 or 13 years old. And and I know of some people that, that think that this being religion to dance. But uh, I have never felt like that I was doing anything wrong about dancing. I think if you're doing something wrong, well, your conscience will teach you so. We went to a lot of square dances on the weekends from, the, from December to January. <clears throat> from December to January. And I learned square dance. Old timey square dance. And one time I remember when I was about 14 or 15, there's a place that they called Denny. Uh, I went to that place one time, and, and there's a man by the name of Ben Miller. That's Eula Rogers' his daddy. He was a fiddler. He was a number one fiddler. Well, I was staying with some man and his wife, and so we, uh, Mr. Ben, had a, a covered wagon and a yoke of oxen, steered or whatever you want to call them. And when I went in a, in a covered wagon to this place, they called it, the name of the place was Denny. That was a blow derby. And the man that lived at where I went, his name was Denny, named him out of the place. and. Yule's daddy, Ben Miller, played the fiddle there for many days. And I tell you, he could play too. I was about maybe 14 years old. Mm -hmm. Did he dance too? Yes, he could dance. He could dance too. I've seen him grab an old dish pan up and pick it and knock it off. <laughs> right, you? Eula Rogers' smooth, flat-foot dancing blends steps and styles so gracefully that it's hard to think of them as individual movements. She glides flat-footed, holds herself up on the balls of her feet, and slides or chugs back and forth, moving easily between these three ways of dancing.
both Biddy Reese and Eula Rogers grew up in the same community with craftsman and dancer Willard Watson, who has influenced younger dancers both locally and from outside the region. Although Willard isn't dancing any longer, Eula has several steps which are similar to his. Animal dances are part of Southern dance tradition. Some people think they're a result of Native American influence. Stanley Hicks learned a few animal dances from other people, and he's made up some on his own. I'd say it's around nine, ten years old, uh -huh. where I learned the flat foot. And then the butt dancing, I learned it off of old people, a lot of Hugh Yonks had taught him, you know, and people like that learned the butt dancing off of him. Mm -hmm. And then the eagle dance, where that is at, uh, I saw a lot of them, you know, either got up pretty grown, I'd say 12, 13 years old. That's when they put the eagle dance on and put uh, one in the center, that was its food, you see and the lizard dance, and, and uh, I mostly learned that myself, you know, just when I come up as a kid, you know, and got to catching lizards and stuff and see how it worked, you know, and all, and then I tried it at school to see how it come out, and, and I learned that mostly myself, the lizard dance. This is a bear dance, is what I can do of it. See if I could, like it was, she'd go down and you turn back and come back. Oh. See, the bear turns over, but I, I see they couldn't make the wig on it. <laughs> Gave you part of it, they see you stand up, and they'll walk. Okay. You, stand, you see, you stand up and walk on your hands, and then you come back into it. <laughs> Some dancers step percussively, and others use movement to express rhythm. Stanley combines both here in what he calls the cross-foot dance. L.C. King's father and all 11 brothers and sisters dance. They're from Madison County, western North Carolina, where Cecil Sharp did much of his collecting of old English ballads. L.C. learned his first flat footsteps from his dad and combined them with some tap steps that he picked up later.
Well, the first was from my father. I watched him over a period of years, and then a friend of mine, uh, he and I used to tap dance some together. Learned a lot from him, and then other than that, just picking it up different people. friend that danced a lot, and I learned from, a lot from him. He learned his, and he had polio, and, uh, and was in the hospital a lot, and uh, there's a, a black man that uh, he uh, taught him a lot how to dance. He watched him, and uh, he would get him up and, uh, and learn him how to dance, and uh, I learned a lot of the tap from him. And over the years, I mixed a little tap dance with, uh, I guess, the flat foot. Younger dancers, some from outside of the region, have made a point of learning traditional styles from older mountain dancers and have organized performing groups. The fiddle puppets have taken what they've learned in new directions, combining styles, especially those of Western North Carolina, making up new steps and introducing mountain dancing to people all over the country. My dancing is a result of my early experiences going to square dances in eastern North Carolina with my parents to later on my involvement in the early days of the Greengrass Cloggers. And the basic step that we used for most of our early precision clogging, traditional clogging, changed due to our meeting of people like Willard Watson, who taught us some old barnyard steps, to our involvement with Hansel Aldrich from Charlotte, who was the first person I ever really saw get up and dance completely on his toes. And then later on, influenced by Robert Dotson from Sugar Grove, North Carolina. And what I'm going to do is have the Dutch Cove String Band to play a couple of tunes or play Sally Ann for me. And I'm going to start out with my very simplest steps up and show you how they evolved into what I do today when I'm just freestyling. So here we go. You ready? Yeah. This is the Eastern North Carolina traveling step.
Ray White first learned to flatfoot as a child around home in western West Virginia. Later, he picked up tap steps by watching traveling professional dancers. His dancing is mostly tap, with some flatfoot and some steps of his own. D. Ray dances with hand patting, singing, storytelling, talking blues, and of course to music. demonstrate to you two or three steps that I learned when I first started dancing. So the first one I ever learned it went something like this. And I could go fast or slow or how I wanted to do it. And the next best step that I learned was a flat foot dance. Something like this. That's what I call a flat foot dance. Then I learned another one, this guy I saw dance, he called it the back step, something like this. And that's about all I learned, but what I learned, the different, different steps that I do, I learned them on my own. I can do a tap, go something this way, And I'll do a one foot right, one foot left. And then I'll put them both together and get the sound. So you can keep any kind of time that you wish when you got steps like this. You got a good layout to go by. It's just it comes natural to you when you learn what you're doing. I got one here I call a shotgun blaze. Wood 
Pecker pecking on a pie. I see you, old Pecker, but you don't see mine. Here we go. I'm gonna do one for you called the Groundhog. Now, I ain't uh, saying that I'm an expert singer, but it helps me keep the rhythm and the time. But just don't pay any mind to, to the words you're listening at or the singing part of it. But I gotta do it because I ain't got no other help. It goes something to look like this. Let's piece of cornbread land on a shelf. Let a piece of cornbread land on a shelf. You won't anymore. You can sing it to a spell. Crown home. Crown home. Crown home. Meat and a hubbard and a hide and a turn. That's it, Fort Pitt. <laughs> this is one I call Rabbit and the broom, broom Sage. I used to do this quite often when I was a younger kid. And go something like this. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna do one here for you now that I just recently made up, or otherwise I'm making it up as a go. It's rhymes and chimes, I call it. Go something like this. Woke up this morning as a drizzle in the rain. Round the corner, come in, change. Riding on crutches. If you want to go to DZ, I'll tell you how to do it. Fish, fish, little mutton soup. No easy. Slide, slide fantastic. You'll be there pretty soon. Up the road and across the creek, I can't get a letter but once a week. I don't know why I got out in this territory, but I'm here. I love it. Gets better all the time. If a station in the Navy, I'd come home and get some gravy. Boy, that'd be fine, wouldn't it? Some of them jumbo brown biscuits. Good, fantastic cold glass of milk. Woo! What town is this? Come here, son. Come on, where's Papo? So I'm have to down a little, man. Now I was about probably a little bigger than this dude. That's my grandson. And that's best I can remember why I was about his size when I began to learn what it was all about, mm -hmm. catching on to different steps and the timing too. Mm -hmm. And I correspond them together and I found out it sounded pretty good in my ears. Be quiet, buddy. 
And so I just taken it up from that point and been doing it ever since. So here's the way they used to do me when I was, before I started walking, you know, they, they do me this way. And after I learned to walk, why, they'd do patting for me and stuff of that nature. They keep enticing me to, to dance. And I started off by something like he's doing there. That's a, what I call a flat foot. Then there's one more style than a flat footer. He can go something like this. See what I mean? That's just natural flat feet. And then I learned the rest of them on my own. And uh, this boy here, he's he's gonna make it. He'll stay up two o'clock in the morning dancing with me. It's, he's got it in him, so if he don't make it, it's gonna be my fault, ain't it? He's off to a good start. I can see that already. Well, I see he's interested in it, and he likes to do it. And I believe he'll make a dancer of some type because he's got it in him, and I like that part of it. When somebody's interested, I'll spend many hours <laughs> trying to help them. Because one day after a while, I'm going to be like the leaves on these trees. I'm going to have to come down. And then I want somebody to pick it up from where I leave off and keep her circulating. Then we'll never run out of good dancing. We'll still have it. 